Okay, then uh, we are ready to continue and uh, today we will start on a new topic regarding uh, inventory control uh, subject to uh, what we call the deterministic demand which means that you have a fixed rate you know or pretend to know exactly what will be the demand for the coming uh, periods uh, and the opposite or, or the other uh, uh, option will be then uh, when you have a so-called stochastic or uncertain demand and then you need to, to do some adjustments on, on, the, uh, on the models we will use. But uh, first we will look at uh, this, chapter 4, and then later in the course uh, we will continue with chapter 5, which uh, uh, concerns the stochastic or uncertain uh, demand. Uh, also, of course, you are aware of the due date for uh, delivery assignment 2. Uh, by tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. I know some of you have already finished, but uh, there are still some who are working with, with the assignment. So uh, I will partly be available during this afternoon, but I have a meeting just after this uh, lecture, so but from 2 o'clock and a few hours, uh, uh, then I will probably be available if you have some particular questions. So. Let's now look at chapter 4 and uh, this uh, type of inventory control. And uh, here we have different reasons for holding inventories. Uh, in general, we can talk uh, about uh, different types of costs, and uh, holding inventories is uh, one type of cost. If you invest very much in your stock, buying inventory for, for uh, storage, then of course it will be costly. You could rather use the money otherwise. You could put them in the bank to get some interest or invest them uh, otherwise. So having a too large stock will not be very cost effective. Uh, but on the other hand, you have other types of cost. Uh, and uh, one cost is of uh, ordering, placing an order, receiving goods, which also is uh, costly. And uh, then we should try to find a way to balance the different costs because when you are ordering very frequent then you don't have to order much and the stock will be uh, pretty small but if you are ordering uh, less frequent then you have to order more items and you need to have a large stock which will be, be costly. Uh, first we'll look, look at different reasons for holding inventories and one is what we call the economy of, uh, of scale uh, means that uh, you might, if you are buying many items uh, at a the time, then uh, you might get some discounts. You might have uh, less uh, administration with the, with the orders, uh, and uh, there could be uh, different uh, uh, other types of, of well, uh, good things you can you can gain by by placing large orders, and uh, uh, you can s uh, save some money on, on different parts of this uh, supply chain. Uh, also, another reason is uh, uncertainty, and here we are talking about uncertainty in delivery lead time, but also uncertainty in demand, which we will come back to, to later. Uh, delivery lead time, it means the time it takes from you place an order, you maybe send an email or push a button uh, and uh, place an order to a vendor, and after a while you will get the delivery of the goods which is ordered. Uh, and this might be a fixed time. You know exactly that it will take three days before the delivery, or it could, could be uh, uncertain. And of course, if this lead time is uncertain, then you need to have a stock of inventory to, to uh, prevent uh, a stock out, because you don't know exactly when you will receive the new order. Uh, there is um, also something called speculation. Uh, which is mentioned as a reason for holding inventory. Uh, cost will change over time. Maybe it is uh, uh, at, the, at a given time you will get a certain low price and then of course you should try to buy as much as possible to get to this low price. Uh, because maybe uh, one week later the, um, uh, the price is uh, expected uh, to rise. So. Uh, this is one, one reason for holding inventory, that you, if when you can uh, buy at a low price, then you should probably buy more than you would have done if the price were, were higher. Uh, another reason is what we call smoothing. Try to level out. This is maybe more 
actual in a situation where you are producing yourself than if you are buying from an external vendor. Because if you are producing, if you are a producer of uh, winter sport equipment, for example, you will have the high season in the winter. Uh, and then it might be difficult to produce in that particular season to meet the demand. So then maybe you should use the summer and build up a stock and then you have something to, to sell when the winter season starts. And this is also typical on other type of, uh, uh, of seasonal uh, products. Uh, demand uncertainty, we have talked about uncertainty in lead time, but also uncertainty in demand is of course uh, important because you don't know ex uh, exactly how much you should, uh, uh, the demand will be uh, in the coming periods and then you should maybe have a large stock or a larger uh, stock to, uh, to make sure that you have enough to deliver for the potential uh, high demand in, in the coming uh, periods. And there might be cost of maintaining what we call the control system, controlling or uh, having an overview over the, the stock, how many items of the different types you have uh, on, on stock at uh, any time. <coughs> uh, we can also talk about what we call the characteristics of inventory systems. Uh, this is uh, characteristics for uh, for the different types of, uh, of markets or different uh, products. Uh, and characteristics might be the on the demand. It could be known or uncertain, which we have talked about. Do you know the, the demand rate? Is it a fixed rate? Or is it uncertain? If it is uncertain, uh, you should try to get some knowledge of it anyway, to have an expected demand, to know the standard deviation in the different periods, for example, to, to have an idea about what will the demand, uh, demand be, even if you don't know the exact uh, amount. Uh, and also, there might be changing or unchanging in time. We have uh, in the forecasting part of this course, we have talked about uh, uh, trends, seasons, for example, and this is also a typical, uh, a typical characteristics of inventory of, uh, of the demand. Uh, lead time, time from you place the order until it is uh, uh, received, and this can also be known at a fixed rate, or it could be stochastic or uncertain. Uh, review time, well, is the system reviewed periodically? Or do you know the state or the size of the stock of all different items at any time? Do you just go into the computer system and find out ho exactly how many items you have? Or do you need to have some kind of counting or, uh, or review at a certain time? Uh, of course, in the latest years, more um, and more is uh, being computerized, but still, the review time is uh, well, quite common uh, that you will have at certain times. For example, every Monday you will get uh, uh, the state of the system. You will know exactly the, uh, the size uh, of the stocks for the different items, but uh, you don't know exactly, or it might be uh, a bit uh, time consuming to get exactly the, the state of, of the system at the uh, Every, every time, but you might have a review time once a week, once a month or something, which um, can give you the, the, the more uh, exact state. Uh, and then we will also talk about the treatment of excess demand. This will be more important when we get to the uh, stochastic or uncertain inventory theory, but you should still know about it, what will happen if you have more demand that, uh, than you have uh, 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 items on stock. Uh, will you have what we call the back order? Do, can you say to the customer who comes to your shop that uh, I'm sorry that we, we don't have the, uh, uh, this particular item now, but you can come back next week because then we will have a new delivery. And then the customer is satisfied and will come back uh, next week uh, and buy for the same price or eventually if you have to, to give him some uh, 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 some discount or you need to keep track of the order which also might be, be costly so so here you might have some costs uh, relevant uh, which is related to back orders even if the customer will come back 
another possible option is that you will lose the excess demand in some markets. So, well, if you don't have the product and the customer go to the neighboring shop and buy it there, and then you will lose this sale. And then, of course, you will lose the profit. Uh, and there might be some variations here that some percentage is willing to wait, and some others will just, uh, you, you will lose that uh, particular sales. And again, we have to talk uh, or mention the inventory, which changes over time, which uh, food is, for example, a very good example there. Uh, food is uh, perishable, and if you can't store it for a very long time, uh, after a while, then it will not be, be useful anymore, and then you have to throw it away. And then you have a maximum uh, limit of how uh, long time you can use for storing the different types of, uh, uh, of products. Uh, and then, of course, it's not always possible to use the order size and have the stock size as you want, because the product will uh, uh, will not be uh, it will not be possible to store the product for for so long as, uh, as uh, it is would be uh, you would want to according to the models you will learn in this course um, another thing obsolescence uh, fashion for example you cannot store uh, all types of, of product because they will be well very popular for a short while and then some other products might take over so if you have a very high stock of uh, a product which is um, well, not uh, modern anymore, then you might be not be able to sell it, or you have to sell it for a much lower price than you otherwise would, would have done. So this is, uh, uh, yeah, or, well, that's some type of pro uh, pro uh, product. Uh, also, there could be new versions of the same product, and there could be new products that replaces old products, which makes the, the old product uh, not so useful anymore. You, a typical example here is uh, the computer versus a typewriter. No one will, well, very few will buy a typewriter anymore, even if it is a good typewriter, because you have other products, computers, which have taken over that, uh, uh, that part of, of the market. Okay, well, we should also talk about relevant costs, and here we have, uh, we can show different parts of what we call the holding cost, because holding cost is the cost which is proportional to the quantity of inventory, uh, the cost of storing inventory, and here you have a percentage which uh, can say for one particular product, we can have a physical cost of the space. You have to rent space for, for the storage area, for example. Uh, and then, in this case, they will count 3% of the value of the, of the product as the physical cost of space. And this could also, uh, for example, be the, the cost of having uh, uh, workers at, the, at the, the storage area that might be included in this part. Uh, taxes and insurance might also be uh, a thing which is uh, uh, costly when you are uh, storing inventory. Uh, in this particular example, they account 10% of the value of the product as taxes and insurance, the cost for insurance and, 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 and tax. And you have a risk of breakage and deterioration. So here, we will also count 1% in this example uh, for this uh, uh, this risk, that 1% of the, of the stock might be uh, broken and not uh, possible to, to sell. And what is the most important part of the holding cost? Uh, and the holding cost here is called, often called the internal interest rate. Uh, and then the major part will usually be the opportunity cost of an al alternative investment. If you didn't invest the money in the stock, you could put, uh, put the money in the bank or invest them in, in some other uh, things, which will give us uh, will give some, some uh, larger uh, interest. So this is then the opportunity cost of the alternative investment, which usually is considered as the major part of the internal interest rate, which is used to calculating the holding cost. So here, 
the total sum of this internal interest rate will then be the sum of 3 plus 2 plus 1 plus 18 percent, a total of 24 in this particular example. <coughs> Okay, we can go back to this, because the note here, since the inventory may be changing on a continuous basis, the holding cost will usually be proportional to the area under the inventory curves. And showing the inventory level might look like this. So we have the inventory in the y-axis, and you have the time axis uh, going here. Uh, in, in the horizontal uh, direction. And then when you receive an order, you will get an exact amount of, uh, uh, of item. And then when you have a fixed demand, this line, the demand line, will be like this at a fixed rate. And you will reach zero inventory. And then you will have a new order. And you will have the same demand rate. And then the uh, holding cost will then be proportional to the area under the inventory curve or the number of items will be this area and to calculate the cost we usually look at the average size of the stock, the average inventory level which in this case will be around here. And since you have a fixed rate the average will be the half of the order size. Uh, so that is one part of the cost function, the holding cost, and then we should also look at the ordering cost, because in this very uh, simple example, we will try to find a balance between the ordering cost, the cost of placing orders, and the holding cost, the cost of storing inventory. And here, ordering, or eventually, if you have a production company, if you are producing yourself, this is, will, be, uh, will be the same in the models. And, but then we can call it the production cost. So ordering and production cost are, uh, well, they are treated in, in the same way, uh, dependent on if you are ordering from an external vendor or if you are producing yourself. And here you have both fixed and variable component, and we have a fixed component here denoted as K, which is the fixed cost for placing one order. Every time you are placing one order or you are setting up the machine for production, then you have to pay or you have to account for a given amount of money as the setup cost or the ordering cost. And in addition, you have some variable costs, which here is on the line. The slope is then called the, the C, which is the cost per item of uh, ordering or, or receiving uh, goods then you will have a given cost or a value per item, which has to be multiplied by x, which now is the number of items per order. So the exact cost of an order will be the sum of the fixed ordering cost, k, and the variable cost, which is dependent on the number of items. But when you are ordering, uh, well, if you are ordering frequent or not so frequent, the total of this variable will usually, variable cost will usually be the same because um, the C, the cost per item, will usually be, uh, be the same independent of the size of the order. Uh, the uh, alternative or the, when the, the cases where this is not the uh, the case is when you have a discount, for example, because then the C, the value, might differ and be dependent of the size of the order. We will come back to models for, for discount a bit later, uh, maybe today or at least uh, next uh, uh, Wednesday. So we should also talk about these types of costs, penalty or shortage cost. Uh, when you have the situation shown here, we don't have to account for penalty because we don't consider stock out. If the rate is fixed, you know exactly the demand. You can plan so you won't have a stock out. You will have a new 
delivery when you reach zero inventory. But when the uh, demand is uncertain, then you might also have a risk for stockout, which could be costly. You need to account for a penalty cost when you have a stockout. So here, all costs that occur uh, when insufficient stock is available to meet the demand, which includes the loss of revenue for a lost demand. If you don't, if you're not able to sell item to customers, then of course you will lose the profit. The cost of bookkeeping back ordered demands, even if the uh, customer will come back, you might have to book uh, well to, to keep track of the, the order, which is uh, well some administrative work, and it's also considered as a cost. Uh, loss of goodwill, not always so easy to, to measure, but uh, if you're not able to satisfy the customer, then of course the customers might not come back the next time. You, you will lose some, some goodwill. And also generally assume that cost is proportional to the number of units of excess uh, demand. So this penalty cost, we will come back to that uh, later when we are talking about uh, uh, stochastic or uncertain uh, inventory models, uh, demand and inventory models, but you should be aware of this also in, in this part of, of the course. Then we will talk about this EOQ model, which might be a known term for some of you. Uh, we shall now uh, present the theory behind this. EOQ is uh, stands for the economic order quantity model, which means that it's a model that will try to balance between the ordering cost and the holding cost. So if you have a line here, and you can see that the different options might be to order all the items you need once for a given time period. And then, of course, you will have you will not have man much uh, ordering cost because you order only once. Then you have the fixed cost. The K parameter will be uh, accounted only once. Uh, but of course, you have to order quite a large uh, number of, of items because you need to order for the, the full demand in the planning period. And then the opposite will be to order exactly when you need it. Then you might have quite frequent orders. You know that you need a given amount of uh, a given number of uh, uh, of item at a certain time. Then place the order so you will get the uh, items exactly when you need them. But then, of course, you need to order very frequent. You don't have a large stock because when you need them, you order, and then you will just sell them further, uh, sell them to to the customer. So so the holding cost on the stock will be rather small, but you will have the uh, much higher ordering cost because you have to hire more frequent. And usually the optimal policy will be somewhere between these two uh, extreme points. Either order once or order when needed, but rather try to find some kind of balance between the two types of costs, which makes the best uh, or, or the most economical uh, policy uh, overall. So, um, we should now try to look at this EOQ model, and we have different assumptions shown here, and uh, the one assumption is that the, the demand is fixed at this Greek letter, lambda units per unit time. And this, this will be like this situation here, that you have a fixed rate, you know the demand rate, you know that tomorrow you will sell a certain number of products. This is fixed. You assume, and by, by experience, you know that this is uh, well should be very uh, 
a very good approximation because this product is, and you have a given number of customers and all of them needs the products at, at certain times. Uh, you have also one assumption here about shortages, which is not allowed, which means that you have to plan to get a new delivery when the stock reaches zero. When you have no more items on stock, you should have a new delivery and you will raise the inventory level to this maximum level. Uh, and the orders are received instantaneously. This will be relaxed later, which is also the well, situation for, for the other assumptions here. But now for the simple EOQ model, we can assume that you will receive the order exactly at the point when you place the order. So here you know that you have no inventory left and then you will immediately get a new delivery. Uh, and of course, if you know about the lead time, you know that you will have uh, used three days for, uh, before you get the delivery. You need to find the reorder point here, which is the level of the stock when you should place a new order, since you have lead time here. This is often denoted as the L. But here, with this simple model, we can assume that the orders are received at the same point that you, uh, the, the orders will, will be received at the same point as you reach zero inventory. Uh, the order quantity is fixed, so we should now try to find what is the optimal size of the order quantity, called the Q, which also will be the top level of, of the stock here. Since we don't account for any safety stock or any shortages with this simple model. And then we have the cost structure look to, looking here. You have the ordering cost, the fixed cost, denoted as the K, and the marginal order cost, or the variable cost, which is dependent on the order size. The C, the unit value, multiplied by X, which is the number of items in the order. And in addition, we have the holding cost, which is the value H per unit held per unit time. And the unit time is usually accounted as in one full year, for example. You have the annual cost. So. Uh, then we can try to look at uh, one example, or maybe we should just continue here. Uh, this is the figure which I also tried to write on the blackboard. Uh, so here you can see that this Q, the order size, will be the difference between zero which is the lowest inventory level, and the maximum inventory level. So when you receive a new order, you will have exactly Q items on stock. And then you will have a fixed rate denoted as the lambda. And since it is a negative slope here, you will use items. You will sell items from the, from the stock. Then the slope of this line will be minus lambda. And you have the timeline here, and this capital T, which is called the cycle time, will tell you how long will this order last. How long does it take between your receiving one order and until you're receiving the next order? <coughs> so let's now try to look at the three different parts of the cost function. The cost function, it can be denoted by the uh, G, which is dependent on the variable Q. So the function G of the variable Q will consist of three parts. One part is what we call the purchase cost, which is the also called the, uh, well, is, it is uh, uh, also the, the variable cost or the cost per unit, 
which is the lambda when lambda denotes the annual demand given here the slope is given as a, a minus lambda it is a rate how fast will you sell this item how fast is the demand given either per year as the annual demand or you can also divide by 12 and get the monthly demand get the weekly or get the daily demand it is just a, a matter of the number of uh, uh, the number of units in in the full usually the demand is given as the annual demand but then you have to to, to find what is uh, uh, the reasonable uh, uh, measure for uh, what you are well to, to, to be consistent with, with the other parameter values. And this will now be multiplied by the C. And here the C is the unit value. Uh, I'm using the, the notations, the same the notation as the uh, textbook, the Namias textbook uses. But what you should also know is that there is no standard notation in this field, so other textbook might use other uh, parameters or other denotations for the same values. Uh, I'm teaching another course at, at master level, with, which uh, includes also this part of the inventory theory, and then, for example, use the V instead of the C. So you should know about uh, this, that the, there is no standard denotation in this field, and there might be different uh, letters or, or different parameters. Uh, for the same uh, same actual, uh, uh, the, there might be different notations for the for the same uh, parameters in in different textbook. This textbook uses lambda as the demand and c as the unit value, and then the purchase cost will be the unit value multiplied by the demand, and usually we account and find the cost function for one full year, so then you should, <coughs> you should have the annual demand multiplied by the unit value. This is called the purchase cost. And we have talked about the two other cost functions, the holding cost and the ordering cost. We can now add the ordering cost and as we saw, the ordering cost could be split in two, but one part is the variable cost, and the variable ordering cost will be included in the purchase cost here, unless you have, uh, have a discount situation, which we will come back to later. So looking at the, the fixed ordering cost, you have to find the number of orders in a full year or a full time period, which is the lambda divided by Q. If lambda is the annual demand, then Q is the order size. And then, of course, if you divide lambda with Q, you will get the number of orders in one full year. If you have a demand of 1,000 per year, and you are ordering 100 every time you place an order, the Q, then, of course, 1,000 divided by 100 is 10. You will have 10 orders per year. And this should now be multiplied by the K value, <coughs> which is the fixed cost of placing an order. The number of orders in one full year multiplied by the fixed cost of placing one order. And, of course, if you have many orders in a year, the total here will be high. If you have not so many, then the total will be lower. And <coughs> the third part will then be the holding cost. And the holding cost is, uh, as we mentioned, it is using the average value of the stock. Here you will have high holding cost. At this point you will have low because you don't have so many items on stock, but you, for calculating the total cost, you need to look at the average, which means that you should use one half and multiplied by Q, the order size. This is the average size of the stock, and this should now be multiplied by the parameter we called H, 
which is the cost of storing one unit of inventory for a full year or per unit time, which usually is the, the full year. So this formula can be used for calculating the annual costs for at least these relevant costs. In for, for of course, in a company, the, there are lots of different types of costs, which is not necessarily relevant for the uh, inventory policy. But here, we will look at these three parts, which is the purchase cost, the ordering cost, and the holding cost. Uh, and we can also look at this figure here and show that the T, the cycle time, can be found by dividing the order size with the demand. Q divided by lambda. This will usually give us a fraction of a year. If you have the annual demand, the demand per year, then Q divided by lambda will give us the fraction of a year. This order will last. The fraction of a year between one order and the next order. And this is the, well, the definition of the cycle time. So if you, uh, in the, as we mentioned in the first example, if you have an annual demand of 1,000, order size of 100, then the T will be 0.1, 10%. The fraction of a year, this order will last. So now, we usually know, or we can assume that we know the demand. We can assume that we know the ordering cost and the holding cost. The holding cost can also be found by multiplying the C value, which is the unit value, by the internal interest rate, which we have talked about and showed in an earlier slide, multiplied by I. And we remember in the uh, example we saw that the internal interest rate we're 24% and it consists of the alternative investment cost, cost cap also called the capital cost, cost of investing money in the stock. Uh, it could be a cost for breakage, it could, could be insurance, or it could be uh, the physical, uh, providing physical space for, uh, for the storage area. So this H, the holding cost per item, will depend on the unit value and the internal interest rate. But here we can only use the, the H value. So if we assume that we know the demand, the ordering or setup cost, and the holding cost, the variable in this formula is the Q. We should now try to determine the order size, which will give us the lowest cost in total. And what you hopefully have learned in mathematics, to find the optimal point of a formula, we should derive it. The derived of a formula will give us the slope, and if you have a minimization or a maximization problem, in this case we want to minimize the cost, and then we might have a graph looking like this, and we want to find the minimum point here, and then, by deriving and setting the derived equal to zero, we will find the point where this line is horizontal. The slope of the derived function is zero. This will be similar if you had a maximization problem. If we, instead of, uh, of wanting to minimize the cost, for example, want to maximize the profit, we would have a similar situation, but then we might have a graph looking like this. And we were looking for the maximum point, but still 
the, when the derived function is equal to zero, then the, this is the point where it, the, the line is horizontal, the slope is horizontal, and that will be uh, similar when you have a minimization or a maximization problem. So now what we want to do is to derive the cost function, set the fun cost function equal to zero, and find out for which value, or we want to find an expression of Q, the order size, which will give us the lowest cost in total with all these three cost functions. So we'll take a break now and in 15 minutes I will continue, show how to derive this formula and show you the uh, so-called EOQ formula which uh, will give us the optimal value of the order size Q.